correcto, patrón. Mi nombre es Roberto Gómez Martínez. Soy investigador del Instituto de Ingeniería de la UNAM y me temo que me toca ser el moderador de esta sesión. Eh, antes que nada, quiero agradecer públicamente a Peter por haber aceptado eh, romper un poco su apretado eh, programa de trabajo y venir aquí con nosotros. Eh, yo en lo personal también agradezco a la MIPTAC y al Comité Organizador el invitarme a presentar a otro más de estos distinguidos conferencistas que tenemos en este Seminario Internacional de Puentes. Eh, actualmente, Peter King es director del eh, Laboratorio de Túnel de Viento de Capa Límite de la Universidad de Western Ontario, en London, Ontario, Canadá. Eh, este eh, laboratorio es muy conocido mundialmente, tiene aproximadamente eh, más de 40 años de existencia este laboratorio, empezó con un túnel de viento y actualmente tienen dos túneles de viento. Entonces, Peter es el director de investigación de este laboratorio, en el cual, yo se estimo yo, se realizan un aproximado de 40 o 50 proyectos por año en respuesta eh, que se meten modelos que se meten al túnel de viento para estudiarse. En los laboratorios que dirige, o en el túnel de viento que dirige Peter King, se hace el estudio de estructuras civiles, uh, como son los edificios y, y puentes. Eh, para darles un ejemplo de los tipos de trabajos que hace Peter King, eh, seguramente la mayoría de ustedes conocen los edificios de la Torre Reforma y la Torre Mayor. ¿Torre Mayor, Peter? Yes. Torre Mayor, eh, esos dos edificios, al menos, y otros más que ha estudiado Peter aquí, que están en la Ciudad de México, en esa zona que se conoce como nuestro pequeño Manhattan, ahí es donde Peter ha estado trabajando en esos edificios principales, ha hecho modelos y de otro tipo de estructuras también para México. En lo que se refiere a puentes, pues Peter ha participado, eh, estimo yo que en más de 100 proyectos en todo el mundo, en lo que es estudiar la respuesta aerodinámica de puentes. Y como muestra de esos puentes, pues les puedo mencionar el puente El Baluarte y el puente El Carrizo, que estoy seguro que todos ustedes, como buenos miembros de la mitad, conocen en la carretera Durango-Mazatlán. Eh, para no quitarle tanto tiempo a Peter, lo único que me falta por mencionar es que el laboratorio que dirige Peter King lleva el nombre de Alan G. Davenport. Davenport, el profesor Davenport, es eh, conocido eh, fue conocido como uno de los padres fundadores de la ingeniería de viento eh, en, en el mundo y Peter en, fue un, un, eh, un investigador que estuvo mucho tiempo asociado muy cercanamente al profesor Davenport, por lo que considero que toda la experiencia, toda la sabiduría del profesor Davenport, Peter es el heredero eh, natural de esa, de esa experiencia. Entonces, eh, también debo reconocer que Peter en algún momento en el proyecto de la planeación y el diseño de nuestro nuevo túnel de viento en la universidad, recurrí a Peter por algún consejo, el cual me fue proveído sin ninguna reticencia. Y para no quitarle más el tiempo a Peter, pues por favor acompáñame a recibirlo con un aplauso. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Roberto. It's uh, indeed a very great pleasure to be at this international seminar for Long Span Bridges. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about the design of Long Span Bridges for wind effects, specifically the use of wind tunnels and wind tunnel technology in order to give the designers the information that they need to be able to provide a safe and economical design. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't speak a bit about the, uh, what I consider to be one of the founders or the fathers of wind engineering, and that is Professor Alan Davenport, who was the uh, founding director of the Boundary Layer Wind Tunnel at, at the, our university. Uh, he started the uh, wind tunnel in 1965, so this is our 50th year of operation and have uh, performed wind tunnel tests for at least 150 uh, long span bridges throughout the world. Uh, you can see that Professor Davenport here is on the left part of the slide. He's worked with uh, Michel Villeneuve on, on a number of projects, including the Normandy port, Pont de Normandy, and uh, the Emile Viaduct, and, and others as well. So uh, again, most of the theories that are being 
used today were developed by Professor Davenport. So why do we test, uh, wind tunnel tests specifically long span bridges? Well, bridge codes cannot provide shape specific coefficients for use in design. They can provide general ideas of what should be used but cannot de develop the specific ones for a particular structure. The detailed aerodynamic information that's required uh, to develop accurate wind loads is also missing from codes. Perhaps in a number of years when we develop more and more uh, uh, access to uh, databases which have aerodynamic factors that might improve the, the uh, desktop studies that would be available. Uh, the other thing is to assess the important aerodynamic stability. Tacoma Narrows is always very fresh in the designer's mind and we want to make sure that there are no instabilities that are um, going to give rise to in, in the particular bridge that uh, we're designing and also to ensure that aerodynamic issues such as vortex shedding in, induced oscillations, which could be important for fatigue issues or important for uh, serviceability issues for pedestrians or users on uh, those types of bridges. But wind tunnel testing can and does have a number of analytical procedures and wind tunnel testing methods to ensure this safe and economic design. So there are a number of steps that I would like to go through. One is the evaluation of the wind climate, uh, preliminary evaluation of wind loads from desktop studies that we've been able to do, and then section model tests. You saw photographs by, by um, Michelle that spoke about the, the tests that were done for the um, third Bosphorus crossing. We've got a, a number of other examples as well. Uh, static tests and dynamic tests are all part of the section model study. And from those uh, experimental results, it's possible then to develop the analytical models for the wind loads that would be used for the, the design. And then finally, the, the full bridge aeroelastic model study is usually used to confirm that the design is proper and that there no issues would be uh, unforeseen and that's the final confirmation. And then the integration with the wind climate actually puts, puts a, a statistical basis on all of the experimental data that we've been able to gather. So fundamental not only to wind tunnel studies for bridges, but also buildings and other structures is the Allen G. Davenport wind loading chain or the Davenport chain as it's known. Uh, this is a, a recognized a uh, chain of procedures that have to be um, followed in order to come up with a safe and efficient design involving the wind climate, the influence of terrain, um, aerodynamic effects, dynamic effects, and criteria. And that's either done for bridges for a simple and a specified wind speed, or it can be quite detailed and actually taking into uh, account the directionality of the wind. So if we look at the wind climate, uh, it usually starts with the analysis of historical records from airports, plus in hurricane zones, a Monte Carlo uh, tropical windstorm simulation. And then these two groups of statistics are merged to come up with the return period uh, or the wind speed r related to the particular re return period for the design element that is um, being looked at. It's usually evaluated at deck height, whatever the deck height is, and the important wind direction is normal to the bridge. So a second analysis is normally done so that it takes the normal component of the wind that is normal to the longitudinal axis of the bridge in order to come up with uh, a better estimate of what the wind speeds might be that are critical for the stability issues. Um, and that normally results in about a 10 to 15 percent reduction in the overall parent climate or the climate of all winds in all directions. The 100 to 125 year return periods are usually used for the design wind speeds and the uh, uh, hourly mean is the 
value that one is using there because you're looking at buffeting loads and it's over a longer period of time. And the 10,000 year return period is usually used for stability but over a much shorter averaging time because it takes much less time for a bridge to actually go unstable than that hourly uh, period. And there's about a 5% difference in the, the two uh, time measures. If we're looking at topographic effects, quite often uh, modeling those, the topography is quite uh, beneficial. So here's a model of the Hong Kong area where we are taking simultaneous measurements at the airport uh, located on the model and then the bridge site. And we're doing this on a one-to-one -one mapping for all wind directions. Then we can translate the statistics that are gathered over a very long period of time at the airport to the actual bridge site and come up with a better estimate of what the site winds are going to be. The other use is to be able to define what the vertical profile of wind. Um, at this small scale, it's not possible to, to get turbulence information, but you can get a very good idea of what the mean might be in any of the sheltering or the shielding or the funneling effects that might have occurred because of the presence of the topography. Uh, preliminary evaluations we can use and draw on a number of tests that have been done on similar uh, shaped structures and using a dynamic analysis the mass properties, mass moment of inertias, uh, perform an equivalent static load analysis to, analysis to provide preliminary loads for initial design. Uh, if the deck shape or the pylon shape is, is quite unique, we can provide a, a, a unique uh, test for that particular structure or for the, the deck in a small open circuit wind tunnel. So here we have the, the small model, which is only about half a meter high, um, measuring the wind speed. Here's the open circuit wind tunnel, and we can get some uh, very quick coefficients that can be used in the analysis. But the main workhorse of all of the uh, wind tunnel studies is, is, of course, the section model. The scale is usually about 1 to 20 to 1 to 80, depending on what, what the full-scale deck width is. Um, and in our particular facility, of the order of half a meter to a meter is, a, is an ideal size of the, the, the model deck width. The model is usually about 2 plus meters long. Um, and it's important to get a long aspect ratio or length to width ratio in order that the correlation effects of the wind can be modeled properly on that type of, of model. Um, for shorter spans, we can use a shorter length model and we try then to match what we call the joint acceptance function, which is a measure of the mode shape of the section model, which is rectangular, it's uniform, uniform vertical and uniform torsional with that of the full-scale bridge, which is a sinusoidal kind of uh, series of modes. So you can imagine that the section model is not going to mimic ideally what the uh, complete model is, or complete bridge is going to um, perform. So we have to take into the account the length of the model. The standard tests are dynamic tests, static tests, and the aerodynamic deriv derivative tests. And perform both in smooth and turbulent flow. The aerodynamic issues that we're looking at are the uh, galloping. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but suffice it to say that the galloping or crosswind motion of bridges is not usually uh, an issue, probably because the drag coefficients of, of bridges are, are much higher than the negative lift slope that might occur. Um, and with modern bridges now, the ideal is to try to have a very flat lift slope so that that does not give rise to a lot of vertical force. Uh, the other idea is to look at the uh, flutter, which can be either a single degree, to, degree of freedom torsional flutter or a coupled vertical and torsional motion flutter. Uh, two other issues are vortex shedding and buffeting, which can be addressed with the section model. So the static test rig that we have is, uh, has two load cells on either side of the, the 
model here is one load cell and the other one would be at the other end, uh, measuring vertical, lateral, and torsional forces. And there's an automatic stepper motor drive which varies the angle of attack between plus or minus 15 degrees if needed. And because the load cells rotate with the model, we're actually measuring body forces which are, are in the direction or of the, uh, of the bridge deck itself. The dynamic test rigs um, has the uh, springs which can be spaced at a different spring spacing to adjust the torsional frequency to the vertical frequency. It has a series of dash pots which we can adjust the structural damping of the, the model. And then here's a series of masses and uh, the load cells that measure the, the, uh, the f wind induced forces. So here's a, an, an, uh, a particular pedestrian bridge that had some issues with galloping, and it was this negative lift slope that we see here. Uh, this is the vertical slope, or vertical force with angle of attack, and when you get this negative lift slope, that is, uh, can be problematic. The dynamic tests are um, performed with a scaling of the geometry, the mass per unit length, the mass moment of inertia per unit length, and the natural frequencies of the full-scale bridge. Uh, the main scaling parameters are the reduced velocities, or the Cauchy number, which is the velocity of the wind in full scale, the natural frequency of the um, either the vertical or torsional modes in the full scale, and the deck width. And the same must be true in the model. The density ratio, because we are using air, which is the same density in full scale that is in model, means that the density of the model must be the same as that in full scale. And the damping ratio is usually quite low in order to provide early indication of what is uh, possible for vortex shedding and, and flutter. But tests are performed at reasonable damping levels in order to provide the proper loads for turbulent buffeting. And again, here's another close-up showing the springs and the, uh, the dash pots and the load cells. Um, whenever you get slender bridge decks, in this case, which is uh, just a steel girder bridge deck, sometimes it's required to add some stiffness to that model, and we use a series of king and queen posts and cable stays to try to stiffen that model. But it's, it's not an easy thing when you get a very flexible model because there aren't cable stays there to, to, uh, to help it as it is in the prototype. So tests are done in smooth flow uh, at a very low turbulence intensity and then in turbulent flow. And the, there's a series of grids that have been designed to provide different turbulence levels. Um, in the wind tunnel, it's at this type of scale at 1 to 50 or, or so. It's impossible to uh, provide the same spectrum of turbulence in full scale as, as in model scale, or model scale rather in full scale. So here are a spectra of the longitudinal uh, component of wind on the top and the vertical spectrum, which is the distribution of energy with frequency. And here we can see what we have able, been able to provide in the wind tunnel, which is this purple line. So the idea is to match the energy at the high frequency end so that this is the, the component or the area which is very important to define what the flow separation points are and the reattachment points of the wind on the actual bridge deck. Um, the, we are missing then a lot of energy in the low frequency end, but this can be handled quasi-steady um, techniques because those gusts are much larger than what the actual bridge deck is. Typical kinds of responses are, as we see here, um, this is the mean displacement and this is the dynamic displacement. You can see here there is a, a, a peculiar kind of peak which is either a model vibration or a vortex shedding. 
This is the vertical response and this is the torsional response, both in smooth flow. And so it's important then to look at the actual frequencies that you see in the model to see whether it is a vibration frequency of the model or a, uh, an actual vortex shedding. So here we see the sprung frequency of the model. Uh, and then these are at th three different wind speeds, 11 meter per second, 20 and 29. You can see that this peak that we saw in the earlier slide is at a much different frequency than what the sprung frequency of the model. It's actually a bending frequency. So these are the things that have to be looked at and either discarded or, or examined in more detail. The other um, area is to look at the peak factor. So when the peak factor is the ratio of the largest response to the RMS, and when we get into a sinusoidal kind of motion, which is either a vortex shedding, where the, the bridge is oscillating at a one particular frequency, the peak factor is uh, 1.4. It's the square root of two, which is the ratio of the peak amplitude of a sine wave to the RMS. When turbulent buffeting is occurring, it's of the order of three and a half to four because it's a random process. And so it's quite easy here to look at those particular areas that might be either responding, responding to vortex shedding or not. And here we have the vertical response. Here is the peak that we're looking at and the, the dash or the circle line up top is the peak factor. So you can see that the peak factor is around three and a half to four and drops down in this particular area for vortex shedding. In the rotational response, the same thing can happen as when the, the bridge goes into a flutter kind of instability, that peak factor also drops down because it's now a purely sinusoidal motion. But when we have a, a response just due to turbulent buffeting, uh, as I said, in this case, we just have a, a, a buffeting type of peak factor of the order of three and a half to four. The aerodynamic derivative tests um, are in a very important component of developing the wind loads. Uh, they were initially um, done by Bleich and here I, but refined by Scanlon. And um, Bob Scanlon at Princeton developed a linearization of these motion-induced forces. So these are the forces that either oppose or, or um, are in the same direction as the motion of the bridge. And there are 18 velocity dependent parameters. I won't go into any of this detail, but suffice it to say that there are two very important ones, the H1 and the A2 developing uh, the vertical aerodynamic damping and the torsional aerodynamic damping. And these can be related in equation form so that the aerodynamic damping, whether it be positive or negative, can be compared to the structural damping that's available from the structure. And when you get a negative total damping, then that's when the bridge is either uh, unstable or, or is in difficult uh, condition. So here we've got a plot of the uh, total damping. Structural damping is here at 1%, and this is the aerodynamic damping. So when the negative aerodynamic damping is equal to the positive structural damping, that's when we get an instability. So there are a number of techniques that uh, we're using to look at the aerodynamic damping. One is a forced oscillation technique where you look at one degree of freedom at a time. Uh, it's a good technique for looking at very high wind speeds where the model would normally go unstable because you can choose the wind speed V, you can choose the uh, excitation frequency F in order to get the desired uh, V over FB. Just a few uh, slides here of how the, uh, the sinusoidal motion device, which is underneath the floor of the wind tunnel, either pushes the model in a torsional mode or in a vertical mode. And then we wind up with aerodynamic derivatives, uh, fit to a, a series of poly, uh, polynomial fits that can be used in analytical predictions of what the bridge is going to do. 
the free vibration technique is the one that is used most often though, and it uh, involves a displacement of the model and then a decaying motion of the, the model, and then what one does is fits all of these 18 parameters to the decay motion that is um, present in the model. There's a, a large scatter in the, in the results, so you have to do this perhaps 50 times or more per wind speed in order to get a stable estimate. And we have a, a series of pneumatic cylinders that provide this uniform initial offset for the model. The pneumatic cylinders release and then allow the model to decay. We're measuring then the displacement and the decay of the model and fitting the parameters to it all online and, and in a matter of, of, of just a couple of minutes. And the same kind of derivatives, aerodynamic derivatives, are come out from, from these as in the forced oscillation method. So uh, next we come, we've got now all of the experimental data that we need to, to provide the uh, equivalent static loads. They're based on uh, some of Dr. Davenport's theories, first of which were used in 1982 on the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Tampa, but it provided loads on the deck alone. Uh, we've now enhanced that to look at the wind loads on the pylons, cables, and provides a complete prediction of what the uh, wind loads are for the, the prototype bridge. It also provides the critical wind speeds for flutter in that this analysis and provides now what to expect in a full aeroelastic model that you might do in terms of bending moments, deflections, and accelerations. And that allows the, com the closing of the loop between the, the various experimental uh, avenues open to us between the, the section model and the full aeroelastic model. So in the definition of the, the loads, there's a background load, which is quasi-steady, it's low frequency, and there's a resonant load, which happens at each of the natural frequencies of the bridge. So we have the turbulence intensity of the wind, we have the actual spectrum of turbulence. Uh, the spectrum of turbulence in the resonant load is only measured at the natural frequency, while the other one is a complete spectrum. The aerodynamic admittance, which is essentially the uh, efficiency of the bridge deck as a lift generator, and the joint acceptance function, which I measured, uh, mentioned earlier about the measurement of the mode shape, and then finally the damping, where we've got both the aerodynamic term and the, the structural term. It's, uh, the equivalent static loads are given as a series of mean loads, which are uniform with length over the bridge, and a series of uh, modal loads, which are either symmetric or anti-symmetric, and can be as many modes as the, the numerical model provides. It's uh, obviously much more efficient for the designer not to have to look at 50 modal loads, so what we do then is to try to enhance each of the modal loads so that we're able to envelope the, the actual uh, response of the bridge that is developed through the, the analysis. So you can see with the, the dark blue line, with only uh, one modal load, we're only getting to perhaps, uh, we're, we're doing very good at mid-span, but not so good in one of the side spans. And so we have to add more loads, more modal loads asymmetric loads uh, in order to get that. And so in, in this case, we're uh, looking at uh, modes up to mode four in the vertical direction to provide a good estimate of what the loading is for that, that particular bridge. Uh, this is how the, the loads are presented. These are modal loads on the left uh, versus uh, deck height wind speed. And then these would be the load distribution functions on the right-hand side, which mimic what the mode shapes are of the, very, of the structure. Then we can do comparisons between the, uh, the loads that are predicted, um, both in, uh, from the section model and then what is being measured in the, the full-scale model. Uh, now, I'd like to talk a bit about the full air elastic, and uh, due to time constraints, I won't have time to talk about the taut strip models, but they both provide 
dynamic information on a mode by mode basis of what the structure is doing in terms of, of response uh, under realistic wind conditions. So it permits a three-dimensional representation of the bridge and the wind simultaneously, where in the section model it's essentially just a two-dimensional. Uh, the, the bridge is normally constructed at a geometric scale of between 1 to 100 and 1 to 250. And this is important because uh, what we have to do is be able to create the proper spectrum of wind and the proper variation of wind speed and turbulence with height. And those are the scales that tend to work most easily with the particular wind tunnel that we, we are using. Uh, complete bridge and cantilever construction stages can be easily examined, but uh, a warning that it's a costly and a, a rather time-consuming approach. It takes of the order of six months or so to perform one of these studies, perhaps three to four months to actually design and construct the model and, uh, and perform the tests there after that. Uh, most long span bridge models are froud scaled. So what that does is it relates the velocity scaling to that of the length scale. And so what it forces you to do is to be able to, uh, if you have a one to 250 scale model, that means you're looking at a 14 to one or so velocity scale between prototype and, and model. It means that you are forced to work in relatively low wind speeds. Um, this is important because it's, uh, it's, if we did not froud scale the model, then that means that the, the, the common area in here is a gravitation, or the force due to gravity. That would not be preserved in the model. And it's, in order to get cable tensions right, you need to model the, the gravitational force. We have a series of, of uh, scaling parameters. So once the length scale is decided and it's froud scaling, everything else comes out uh, from that particular, that single um, selection of scale. We have a number of uh, methodologies to provide the right stiffness for the, the deck. Uh, it's important to measure or to model uh, the vertical, lateral, and torsional stiffness of the the, of the equivalent deck, and we normally use a, a channel shape, so that enables us to be able to provide the, the torsional stiffness at the same time as the lateral and the, and the vertical. Uh, there are a number of problems that you do encounter in designing the full aeroelastic model. One is that you cannot scale the axial force at the same time as you're scaling the bending force. So. When you have a structure such as this uh, pylon, which, um, which resists overturning moment, both not only to the bending of the, at the base of the, of the foundation, but also the axial forces that are present in the, in the uh, pylon legs, you have to do some uh, adjustments to the model that you're um, presenting in order to come up with the right uh, bending moments in, that you're measuring under wind load. So as an example, I'd like to show the, uh, the new bridge over the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, this is in Montreal in Canada. It's not a huge uh, span uh, cable stay bridge. The main span is about 240 meters, but it does present a number of unique problems that had to be overcome. So if you look at the, the side elevation view, it looks fairly normal but the, uh, the width of the deck is separated into three separate boxes um, with a transit corridor in the center box and uh, I think at least three lanes of traffic and a pedestrian walkway on either the north side and the south side. The uh, St. Lawrence Seaway is this diagonal uh, cut through between the main tower and the east here, but the, the main complicating thing here was the, uh, the presence of the cross boxes. So for lateral wind loads, if what we're trying to do is, is provide information on each of the decks. So we need to provide what the bending moment is in the lateral direction due to the wind load. But if we can't 
simulate the axial force or the axial stiffness that's present in the deck, that gives us some, some difficulty. So what we had to do is create a numerical model that had uh, 3D frame elements for the cross boxes and then to relax those so that we wind up with this sort of Virendil truss in order that the deflection of the deck is between the target and the air elastic model is, is equivalent. And so therefore the bending moments that we're going to be measuring in the decks are, are going to be correct. The cross boxes are not that um, critical in terms of the aerodynamic behavior, so we acknowledge that those, those forces that are present in the in moments in the cross boxes won't be, won't be correct. Um, the same thing can be looked at for the, the tower, although in the presence of a lateral load, the deflection at the top of the tower is, is uh, identical between the model and the target. What is not uh, simulated very well between the bending moments at the base of the, of the tower, there's almost a factor of two in the difference between the target and the aeroelastic model. And the aeroelastic model is non-conservative. So we It's the battery is gone. Okay. Um, so there's a factor of two or so between these two. So what we uh, decided to do then is create a correction factor so that we could adjust those bending moments that were measured in the model under wind to what they might be uh, for the prototype. Here's a typical internal structure of a furl aeroelastic model, and this is the Baluarte bridge here in, in uh, Mexico. The, um, these are two of the deck spine elements, and this is the pylon element. And again, we had to adjust the uh, leg sizes here in order to come up with the the proper simulation of the and measurement of the bending moments. Here are a series of strain gauges that are located at the base of the pylon in order to come up with the proper foundation loads. Uh, each one of these would be individual cali individually calibrated so we arrive at the, the uh, required um, parameter for the, the design team. Uh, cables, we mod model the AE over L, or extensional stiffness of the cable uh, using small coil springs. The uh, drag coefficient of the cable is preserved for drag loads only so that we wind up with our proper wind loads that are acting on the tower as a result of the, the cables. But because the scale is so small, uh, the cable vibration is not correct at all. Um, so here's uh, an example of what the, the cladding segments might look like. The cladding segments are mass scaled but provide uh, only geometry and, and no stiffness. So they're individually separated for one, from one another. In this case, there's a curved pedestrian bridge that has 62 deck modules, which you can um, simulate just about anything that you need in terms of very high detail using a, a rapid prototyping machine. Here's a typical deck module where the deck spine runs through uh, in red here and in black. Those are the added mass components to provide the right mass and mass moment of inertia for that section of bridge deck. And the, the spines and the rapid prototype cladding that goes on the, on the pylon. The pylon cladding has ballasted for weight and then has the proper cable anchorage that are located up on the top of the, of the pylon. The model assembly, here's the, the curved model as I mentioned. Uh, the model assembly goes fairly quickly once all of the components are manufactured and we have uh, a series of instrumentation. So we have strain gauges at six different cross sections provided providing the uh, lateral bending moment, vertical bending moment, and torsional forces that are in the deck. Uh, deflections at three different cross sections looking at the vertical drag and, and the uh, lateral motion, as well as the accelerations. This is a pedestrian bridge and accelerations is very important uh, to be able to match or meet the criteria that are uh, provided in the in the, as a design parameter. 
Uh, we've got up to 64 channels so we can look at simultaneously for this particular, or for these studies. But I mentioned before that it's important to match the, the turbulence. And so here you can see the, the measured spectra, how we're matching that between the model scale and that of the prototype. It's much easier to do at the smaller scale of the full air elastic model than it is of the, the section model. Velocity profiles are also matched reasonably well, and specifically deck details. Because of the larger scale of the model, you can, and the rapid prototyping machine, you can simulate just about anything you need in terms of railings, handrails, and, and even lighting standards. Um, bearings are a particular thing that have to be looked at. Normal bearings uh, would have some frictional component, but in a model that is this small, this small we don't want to have friction uh, because that does complicate life uh, quite, a, quite a bit. So what we've used are leaf springs, which provide almost a frictionless longitudinal restraint or, or vertical restraint uh, to the deck. Uh, with full air elastic models, you can look at a number of directions, skewed directions, uh, under the actual turbulence conditions that would be present for those particular directions, including uh, normal winds. Uh, cantilever construction stages are easily looked at um, as long as the joints are modeled in the actual deck so that a portion can be removed as the, uh, to simulate the construction stage. This is a, a photo of the Balawarti Bridge that was done uh, a few, uh, few years ago now at the uh, Boundary Layer Wind Tunnel Lab. It was important in this case because of the depth of the gorge to actually model what the topography was like in that vicinity because it conditions, not only conditions the wind, but it directs the flow in different directions that one would normally uh, think might be the case creates different turbulence conditions. So as you move along the deck, you don't have a uniform wind speed, you don't have a uniform wind direction. So that is easily handled with the full air elastic model. The El Carrizo Bridge was a very similar kind of, of uh, structure, just um, in the same roadway, uh, the same highway of the, the Balawarte. And here we were looking at the construction stages as well. Um, the response of the, of the full air elastic model is developed in a both mean and dynamic uh, responses, providing drag bending moments, lift moments, torsional moments, responses in terms of deflection and accelerations, uh, which to be able to feed back to the, the design team to make sure that it was compliant. So in conclusion, uh, a comprehensive wind information investigation can provide the designer with site-specific wind criteria through the wind climate and ana analysis, structure-specific wind loads for the design of unique bridges that designers are looking at nowadays, uh, the assurance of aerodynamic stability, verification of the satisfactory levels of deck accelerations for pedestrian structures, and construction stages, wind loads, and behavior under different uh, construction stages and scenarios, including construction equipment that might be present uh, during the, the fabrication and construction of the bridge. So thank you very much for your attention.